So customer deliveries of the gorgeous Lotus Electra have now started and this is one of them. Uh, so before getting to this video reviewing this car, big thanks to Michael, one of our viewers that's just down the road from our offices. He's just taken delivery of his car and he's been very kind to let us come down and have a look at it today. Get to explore it in a bit more detail. This is a customer delivered version, not a pre-delivery press car. Uh, so we can have a good look around it. We can even take it for a drive and see what we think of it. And it's just a phenomenal looking car. Really pleased to see this coming out on the road now. So let's show you around. My name is Richard Simons and this is the Lotus Electra. Now it's probably worth having a look on the Lotus website and uh, building a configurator for yourself. Uh, but let's cover a few bits. So all run the same battery, 112 kilowatt hour battery with over 100 kilowatt hours usable, 800 volt architecture, up to 350 kilowatt charging speed. The, the sort of three versions, the, the Electra, Electra S, and the Electra R. The R is a super fast one, 0 to 60 in under three seconds. The Electra and Electra S, more like four and a half seconds, 0 to 60. There are quite a few options of features, dynamic handling packages, different color schemes, different interiors. Uh, so let's just cover what this one is so that you know what we're reviewing in this video. I'm gonna pull out my little list so I can tell you exactly what it is. So this is kind of built on the base spec model, just the Electra, but with some optional extras, and they include, uh, and the base model starts at just under £90,000, by the way. But add a few extras. So this one's got the 22-inch five-spoke diamond-cut in grey uh, carbon fibre wheels, 2,000 upgrade. You can get up to 23-inch alloy wheels for the Electra. This has got the active aero package, 2,000. Air quality system, £200. The configurable ambient lighting, uh, this is in Galloway Green, which by the way, I mean, hopefully we can grab some of the uh, shots just showing just how lovely and sparkly and deep this paint is. It is gorgeous. Um, we've got the Highway Assist package, 1450. The intelligent glass roof, so it's got the full glass roof, but it automatically tints and dims. Um, goes kind of opaque uh, when the sun's out. You can manually override that, but otherwise it's automatic and I can show you more of that in a minute, but it looks great. This one, which is what I'm really interested in on the test drive, has got a dynamic handling package. So that promises some good things. It's gonna be very interesting to see what that's like. Privacy glass, quartz interior, the side cameras. So instead of wing mirrors, we've got the side cameras on this one. And that brings the base Electra from 90,000 up to 111,000 pounds of this particular model here. If you go and purchase an Electra R and tick all the boxes, you're gonna end up in a region of about 170,000 pounds. So not cheap cars. Although if you can buy one through a business, your benefit in kind liability tax is probably only gonna be up to about 60 pounds a month. So yeah, you know, business buyers, it could be an option for you there. And of course there's some corporation tax savings there. Anyway, that's not what this video is about. This is about just having a good look around this car, taking it for a drive. And I'm also gonna get some feedback from the owner because Michael uh, previously owned a Tesla. And so coming from a Tesla to one of these, what does he think? What are the pros and cons comparing the two? You gotta remember, Tesla made the decision not to bring out right-hand drive for the new Model S and X. And so I think they're probably gifting some sales to the likes of Porsche with the Taycan, Audi, and now Lotus with the Electra. Right, now, it's a beautiful car. Let's have a look around it before we take it for a drive. So starting at the front, I mean, it's got this kind of shark nose front end here. Uh, I love it. This is, this is the bit where in person, uh, you can see how these air scoops right up through here. And if my arm was long enough, it would come out up there. I can also go through here and you can see that comes through there. So the sculpture on it's really amazing. It's lovely. There is a little camera here for the um, surround camera system. 
And then at the front here, we've got all these little sort of triangles that open and close for the uh, uh, cooling systems. Uh, it just looks great, I think. Interestingly, these aren't the headlights as such. These are ambient and lighting effect. The main headlights are actually in here. And so we've got some matrix headlights going on and these do some nice light displays when you lock and unlock the car. And also they'll be illuminated when you're driving. Looks lovely. Right, let's come around to the side. So these are huge 22 inch wheels. You can get up to 23 inches but they don't look that big on the car, do they? Uh, so at the front here, we've got two 7540R22s, and it's come with Pirelli P0 tires, uh, the electric version. The rear tires are bigger, so different sizes, and at the rear, we have 31535R22s, again, P0s, of course. Pop-out door handles. This is a bit like a Jaguar I-Pace, Tesla Model S, they pop in and out. Uh, it's worth showing you actually the key. So the key is this little device here in my pocket, which I've got a little protective bag. And you hold this key, or keep it in your pocket, and that obviously opens and closes the doors. We've got double glazing, so on the side here and on the rear, we've got double glazing. This one's got the sun protection glass. No soft close on this model, but if you go for the higher spec ones, you will get that. There's an interesting little plaque in here actually, the Colin Chapman uh, plaque here. Uh, very nice. And then you come to the back here, again, you've got some nice little scoops that come through here, come out here. You've got this lovely design of the rear spoiler. So what do you think of how this looks? I think it is gorgeous. Let's have a quick look at the back before we get inside it. It's probably one of the only cars where I can stand here and see my rear tires, because down through here is a scoop that comes out there. Uh, again, I just love this kind of sweeping lines. And hopefully all this aero design not only looks good, but helps with efficiency. It's quite a big, heavy car, it's two and a half tons, I know, but we'll see what it gets. It won't be as efficient as a Tesla, but uh, we'll see what it gets on our test run. Anyway, onto that in a minute. Camera, LiDAR, uh, carbon spoiler. Now this actually uh, is a spoiler that lifts up and down, not this section, this whole back panel. Uh, it's part of the active aero, although I think now it might be part of the efficiency package, which includes this and the wing mirrors. Some of the spec configurations have changed since this was first ordered compared to what's available now. Uh, you've got a light bar right across the back here. Of course, there's another camera under here, and then it breaks down to the bottom section in black, which has got some parking sensors in it there. Now, if I open this up, power tailgate, of course. So this is 688 litres of boot space. There's actually 46 litres available at the front. It goes to over 1,500 litres when the seats are folded. Uh, very luxurious it looks too, this kind of Alcantara I'm already seeing here. You've got this kind of solid uh, parcel shelf system here, which can be removed. Nothing really for storage under the boot floor, apart from a few knickknacks. Uh, what is quite interesting here, uh, it's not quite a flat load area, by the way. It just kind of drops down a little bit, but it looks pretty wide and practical. There's a little button on the side here, though. I'll check this out. So, if that was a little bit too high up for your loading, and now it's much easier. And there's a button to lift this back up as well. In case that's useful. There we go. Quite cool, isn't it? Let's put it back down again. So a manual release to fold the seats. No button in the boot like some cars have. <coughs> Tesla Model Y. Uh, in here, doesn't quite fold flat completely, but it's a pretty practical load space and a luxury car like this. How much serious load hauling do you need? But I think family holiday, four people, shouldn't be a problem. Now, as I fold that seat back up, it does that thing which can be a bit annoying where it catches the seat belt. So you have to pull this out and put that back and it's still caught down there. So I need to pull that out again, pull that bit round and pull that back. Now, one thing the Nissan Aria has is a nice little strap across the top of the seat here. Quite a simple little thing, which means as you fold the seat, the belt goes with it, which means you just put the seat back up. It doesn't have that, but it does have one of the nicest looking uh, sort of surrounds for seat belt feed I think I've seen in any car. Have a look at this. Ooh. I'm going to cover more of this in a minute once I've driven the car. Very keen to have a drive, so I'm going to do that in a second. But first impressions of the interior here, lovely, nice big clear screen. So a little display down here of your speedo and a bit of your battery range and percentage there. There's actually some little display here with your radio station information. It's nicely laid out, lovely trim materials. I mean, we saw this at the show and it's just a gorgeous thing. Head up display in this one. Is it any good in the back though? Wow, look at that space. Very, very good. So I'll get my feet under the seat in front of my position. Look at all this knee room. Plenty of space. 
Uh, the rear seats recline as well, so I've got a button down the side actually. So if I bring it to a more upright position like that, and then it also reclines all the way back. This lovely glass roof, this Alcantara trimmed all the way along here. There's even some nice sort of detail stitching on the, the handle here. I love this detail here. It's very, very nice. There's a screen here as well for rear passengers to adjust their own climate control. And it's great. I can easily see four adults very comfortably sitting in here. There's sufficient space between the seat base and the floor. I guess it could probably be up a little bit more and sculpt a bit better, but look, it means I can put my feet down and stretch out like this. It's very comfortable. There is a center armrest, which includes some cup holders. And there's a bit of storage in here as well for a few knickknacks, pens, pencils, phone, that sort of thing. Okay, so in the middle, all right. There isn't a sort of transmission tunnel as such, there is a lump, but where this center console comes back quite a long way, I can't actually get my feet behind this. So I would need to straddle like this, but I've got enough headroom. The seat base is a little bit higher up here. There's not tons of width. So it's one of those ones, five people occasionally, but for four, very comfortable in the back, I would say. Seems very reasonable. Uh, right, okay, look, I'm really keen to drive this car. So let's get on with that. And then I can give you some more opinion and show you a little bit more of the software and explain how the camera LiDAR systems work, hopefully, what efficiency we get. Let's get on with it. I can feel that rear steering. So I can adjust my region with the paddle on the left. And what it does seem to do, apparently, is if you set it how you like it, this looks like there's about four or five stages of region adjustment, is if you leave it at the setting you like, it will be at that setting next time you drive it, which is good, because there's cars that don't do that. Q Hyundai Ionic 5 tends to always default back to one setting, as far as I remember. So, my first impressions here. Smooth, and this is with 22 inch wheels, it feels quite smooth. Big tires, but it feels quite quiet. There's a nice view out the front. Got to get used to the wing mirror cameras, but you do get used to them, it takes a little while. I had these on an Audi e-tron 55, and initially they seemed a bit strange, but because you don't get different views when you move your head, but actually you do get used to them, and there's certain situations where they're better. Well, this is nice. The seat's quite firm, but it's nicely supportive. Tons of adjustment on these seats. So you should better get very comfortable. I feel quite at home here. Yep, yep, happy to have this. So I think on this test trip, I'm gonna be focused more on just enjoying the car and what it's like to drive. And um, what I will do though, is I'll have reset the trip and take a note of the state of battery charge at the start of the journey. And I will be able to get a bit of a measure of what real world efficiency we get. It's a mixed route that includes some city driving, some A roads, and some faster dual carriageway and motorway driving. So a real mixture of different conditions. Should be a good real world simulation. But as I'm now picking up some speed on a dual carriageway, that's nice and smooth, isn't it? So this is quite like a, at the moment, my first comparison is probably like a Taycan, but higher up. So you've got that nice ride comfort. It's still very positive on the steering, quite quiet. Uh, the graphics here are very much like a Tesla for the uh, visualization of the car going down the road and the kind of autopilot type systems. Just a little bit of wind noise, but we do have double glazing on this car. It's pretty quiet. It's okay. I hear a little bit of a wind rustle over there, but it's smooth and refined. Very good. And this steering wheel is an odd shape. It's kind of hexagonal, but yeah, feels nice in the hands. It's nice. If you twiddle the wheel fast in drifts, I don't know how that will feel then, but I'm not going to be doing that today. <laughs> Nervously lost Michael in the back of the car. Yeah, so if you're in an uncontrollable drift, Michael, how is this uh, hexagonal steering wheel to grip? <laughs> I'll leave you to find out. Yeah. Oh, you are? Okay. Oh, it's nice and responsive, isn't it? Look at that ease of pulling away. Yeah. And I'm not going to be flooring this car. I'm going to be very respectful of how I drive it because Michael's in the back. Uh, the wing mirror camera is actually nice and clear, I like those. So, this is quite a big, high car. Doesn't lean much, does it? I spent a bit of time driving a Tesla Model X Plaid, actually, and uh, so it's probably reasonable to put some comparisons compared to that. Now, this is better at that, which is going around the corner. This feels 
again from here this was very precise it's very level and yet you've got the comfortable ride as well a model x plaid doesn't do a bad job but this has got a bit more precision to its steering and it doesn't lean as much but it's still got the ride comfort to it as well so it kind of from here it doesn't feel as big as the car is it's quite a large suv type car but apart from sitting high up it feels quite sporty which is i guess exactly what it's all about with the lotus and i like that does this gravel car park count as off-road <laughs> uh, this is going off-road mode do we need off-road mode for this because there's a puddle here and there's a speed bump there so let's go to off-road mode for this one. Ah, oh, yeah off-road's capably doesn't it <laughs> This is, uh, you'd never ever get a normal car along here. This is Range Rover territory. <laughs> How is he doing that? There's a Tesla there. <laughs> okay, that's off-road mode tested. So let's uh, switch drive modes. I'm using the paddle here to do that. A little bit of tight junction. How's the steering angle? Oh, good steering lock. That's good. Oh, effortlessly smooth. So this is a single speed transmission, but if you get the R, you have a two-speed transmission on the rear axle, much like a Porsche Taycan. So whilst I've got adjustable region, it doesn't do quite like a tester where it comes to a complete stop and automatically holds the car. It goes down to about five miles per hour and then eases off and you have to push the brakes. A bit like a Porsche Taycan in that respect, although a Porsche Taycan regen is mild at best. It really does simulate kind of driving a normal car. This is good. You can make it quite a strong regen effect, just doesn't quite do the final stop and hold which you can in a tesla i quite like having that i guess it would be nice to have the option here amongst its variable adjustment again nice to be able to just adjust it from the steering wheel paddles here though much like the drive mode it makes it nice and easy to just flick between different modes depending on what you like <laughs> now what was that warning well that is a, a sort of collision because there was a pedestrian on the yeah. pavement and they, it was on the curb but because i was heading towards them it did i mean it's picking up pedestrians see this lady crossing the road here it's picking her up there so it's definitely on the on the lookout of all these cameras isn't it yeah. for safety but it's a warning be careful it didn't intercept me there it just gave me that warning that there's a pedestrian which is probably quite legitimate even though they're on the pavement so there's a quite a fast corner junction here and i'll flick it into sport see how this uh lack of body roll works here so i'm going to this corner at 44 miles per hour oh that's good that's good and the acceleration out of that whoop yeah that's a quick car so that was quite a fast corner round uh onto this dual carriageway and this stayed remarkably flat that really works that dynamic handling package that really works that's good for a car this high up it's super impressive he just drives like a sports car just sitting high up very clever. So I've just been looking at the trip computer here from that journey and I covered 23.1 miles of mixed conditions from a cold start on a chilly day and it's quite windy today as well. Uh, now I used 9% of my battery to do that 23.1 miles so you're probably right to the hour today's conditions on that would be a real wide range of about 255 miles um, but I will emphasize it's from a cold start on a cold day. My efficiency uh, on this is showing as 41.1 kilowatt hours per 100 miles. So uh, that works out to about 2.4 uh, miles per kilowatt hour. Yes, to just over 2.4 miles per kilowatt hour, which is uh, certainly less efficient than a Tesla would be. Uh, I think it feels like on this car, once you settle into a run um, or have got the battery preheated, you do a longer journey, that will get better it's going to be uh, capable of 300 miles i think it's going to take a little bit to get it over 300 miles i mean it, you don't expect a big suv type thing to be especially efficient i mean look at a, a range rover you know uh so uh, yes less efficient than something like a tesla model y less efficient from my testing compared to a tesla model x absolutely i'll give them that but that's usually what we expect but we do have that very large battery which will sort of compensate in terms of being able to get a good real world range out of it so it should be quite easy capable of 250 to 300 miles real world uh again i will emphasize as well you know this is quite a new car out over time it's not uncommon for electric cars to go through a number of uh, tweaks and software updates remote software updates will uh, usually enable 
faster, um, uh, better efficiency, better range and stuff like that. So uh, it wouldn't be unusual to expect to see some improvements with efficiency. Uh, so this is the view you get when you're manoeuvring. You've got a nice bird's eye view, uh, rear camera, give me a warning there. And I've got the wing mirror cameras. And if I switch to drive, then I'll see the front camera as well. Uh, right, let's give you a bit of an overview of the uh, main sensor screen here. Similar to test, there are a couple of temperature buttons at the bo uh, bottom here. So if I decrease the temperature, I get this nice little blue light. And if I increase it, red light, uh, quite a nice little detail. Uh, if it's a Mercedes EQE, it lights the whole dashboard up in strobing blue and red. Uh, so a few climate control buttons here uh, that we're quite familiar with. But the, uh, these seats don't have air conditioning, not vented cooled, but you can get them. This one's got heated seats, heated steering wheel, dual zone climate plus climate for the rear. What I do have here is a control for the rear as well. And I do have some massage seat options. So yeah, they're good. Uh, and you can change whether it's standard, soft or strong, start your massage there. Same for the passenger, different types of massage option. That's rather nice. And if I go to settings here, then you can choose here whether it automatically starts your steering wheel heating, how long your heated seat stays on for, cabin overheat protection, same wording as Tesla. Uh, so there's a few things there. Front windscreen fogging monitoring. Turns on the air conditioning, made front windscreen fogs up. Well, let's turn that on. Should always be on, shouldn't it? Shouldn't be an option, really. Uh, let's go to the other menus in the car, though. So normally when you're driving, actually, you see a screen like this. You've got your satellite navigation, which I won't show in too much detail because we're at someone's house. Let me move that around a little bit somewhere here. So this is not where the person lives now. Uh, pretty responsive. It's not too bad. You can zoom in and out. No problem. And then this section here is very much like, again, I'll say the word Tesla, uh, Tesla Autopilot and visuals. So if you're driving a Tesla Model Y or 3, it looks very much the same. It shows the lanes, shows other vehicles, shows pedestrians, shows cones, very much like Tesla. Uh, unlike Tesla, you've actually got your speed display here, plus you've got a head-up display there. This little cluster here does show you how much regen you've got, what your cruise control is on, how many miles of range you've got, your battery percentage and what drive mode you're in. So it's handy to have that in front. This one does have head-up display, it has that. And this side here, we've got what radio station is selected at the moment. Anyway, back to this screen. Just thought I'd better mention those before I forget. Uh, if I go to uh, here, it's kind of like a home menu here. So again, shows you what battery percentage you've got. And then in here, sort of more like your setup uh, side of things. So if we start on the left-hand side here, I'll just run through it quite quickly so you can see what we've got. Uh, options to uh, automatically unlock as you walk up. Now, this is quite a good one. Auto transparency for this intelligent glass roof. Remember, this isn't standard. It's not sure extra, but this one has it. So it can be set to auto. So when it's bright, this goes cloudy and doesn't let the sun directly through. But if I turn that off, I can now go from automatic to a manual adjustment so there we go i'll just fog that out and now i can make it transparent very good clever stuff isn't it then in here some options for uh, auto hold hill descent control tire pressure sensors jack in mode whether you want the mirrors to tilt when you're reversing wireless device charging can turn that off but i don't know why it wouldn't always be on but anyway a welcome show for the lights absolutely we want that some good lighting functions there the next menu across is light where you can change the ambient colors in here so you can have green blue pink whatever colors you like for the interior ambient lighting and the response to the climate control inputs uh, this one i wondered what it was here tourist mode <laughs> so tourist mode actually means if you're going to drive on the left or right hand side of the road so for us if we cross the channel into france it means you can change the headlight beam pattern which makes sense very good right driving mode here so this is where you can see now you can change driving mode from the paddle here to sport an individual where you can configure different settings for uh, ride height um, the throttle response and the steering weight so you can set up your own version for that there and then you've got off-road mode, of course it lifts up, and you can set your ride height to highest, so now we're really lifting up as high as it goes. And it does have quite a good travel between its high and low modes. Range mode here, now we're dropping back down, softer throttle, it does what it can to be as efficient. Tour, it seems to be what they would just call like normal, so it's kind of the default setting is tour, uh, which does give you the option to adjust your ride height separately here um, as well, if you need it.
So when I was driving it, we're just in standard ride height. Uh, safety options here, so uh, fatigue detection. Now it came up with a fatigue warning when I was driving and I was paying attention. I was actually setting the uh, cruise control, so maybe I was looking at the cruise control, but it told me I was tired apparently. I don't feel very tired at all. Uh, lane keep assist, this kind of stuff here, active safety, rear collision warnings, cross traffic alert. Uh, this is where if you're, say, reversing out of your driveway and it thinks there's cars coming, it can actually uh, uh, hit the brakes and stop you reversing out into cross traffic. Life detection on care. What do you think that means? So does it mean me? Is my life not being well cared for? Uh, no, this is actually to monitor and alert if there are any children left uh, after locking the car. So if you leave kids in the car uh, or a dog or pet, something like that. Uh, it's just some of the wording, so maybe this is sort of, uh, you know, Chinese translation and uh, some of the Chinese origins of this starting to come through. It's just slightly word, strange wording, I would have said, but anyway. Uh, sound, KF, Dolby Atmos, good sound system, uh, spatial option, and there are upgrades on this one as well, so they should be absolutely amazing. Uh, display brightness, fairly self-explanatory there. A few options, drive display, passenger display, side camera display, how bright it is. Now, um, this actually, oh, here we go, that's a bit better. Now, I did set in a different one how bright it was. It didn't seem that bright. So this is now a brighter setting, which is better. I have been finding that actually I was seeing quite a lot of uh, reflections, but now this is brighter here. That's better, but that wasn't immediately obvious to me before. Side camera display brightness, let's have a good look. That's, oh, that's slightly better as well. well. Hopefully I've improved the settings slightly. I've probably just ruined Michael's car setup, how he exactly lights it, but anyway. So in the charging menu here, uh, this is where, again, you've got a daily and trip charging limit. So it looks like trip char uh, daily charging limit is set to 95%. Uh, this, the owner of this car had it at 90%, but it looks like your daily charge limit 95 rather than uh, 85, 90. Different cars have different amounts. Some cars are 100% daily, if it's LFP Model 3, for example. Drive battery temperature management, maximum current for the AC charging. Anyway, a couple of options there. And then in here, uh, we've got some of the trip information. So this is the trip on my last journey there. And this is where I'd probably like to see better. Better efficiency, although it is a rather large car. And there's a visual here for opening the charge port, for example. Power charge port opening. And I can open the tailgate from here as well. So there we have it, a quick sort of visual around the car. This screen is quite a nice graphic, quite a nice display. I rather like it. It's an OLED screen, apparently. Uh, when you're actually in park and the vehicle's locked and get out, it actually folds down against this dashboard and goes sort of horizontally flat. Don't really know what for, but it does. So this OLED screen, yeah, pretty good. They, I saw on the Lotus website it claims zero lag. I wouldn't quite call it that, but it's pretty good. It's pretty responsive, and the graphics are pretty nice. So this shouldn't just be my opinion. I mentioned that this is actually from one of our viewers, and previously he actually owned a Tesla. Um, his last car was a Tesla Model Y Long Range. So. I've got here a list that he's written up for me kindly to say what he prefers with the Lotus and what he prefers with the Tesla. So let's start with the Lotus first. He prefers the ride comfort, the handling, the flat cornering, uh, the steering feel, the styling and the paint color, the quality, the materials in the cabin, the being able to personalize the car more so there's more options, there's less likely to be two cars the same on the road. Uh, it's quieter, less tire noise, more rear seat space, um, the controls have got a better mixture of switches and buttons. It's not all just on the screen. He likes that. So the shortcuts for the temperature control, for example, in the middle. The sound system. I mean, the Tesla Model Y long range has got a good sound system, but this is apparently better. And there's an upgraded version of this one as well. So God knows what that's like. And the voice activation, he says, is more reliable than the Tesla. Interesting feedback. Uh, on the downside, what did he prefer with the Tesla? Well, it was much more efficient, possibly over 50% better than Lotus, which based on our efficiency, then I think we'd, we'd quite agree was likely to be the case. Um, the Tesla, in a way, is better value for money. The software is more developed with the Tesla. The Lotus is good, bearing in mind it's, it's, you know, it's quite a new product still. Um, and he, it is quite nice to use. He says it's perfectly acceptable, but ultimately, like most cases, the Tesla is just another level on their software. 
Uh, the Tesla had more entertainment apps, so things like YouTube and Netflix were available on there. The Tesla supercharging network, yes, the cost and availability of them is nice to have and, and better. Uh, and the automatic access and locking from the phone. So just forget about it, it's totally automatic. This, you have to have that fob uh, key kind of in your pocket. And when you exit, you push the button to lock the car. Uh, it's nice for the test of just having your phone. And again, with something we've said in a lot of our videos before, uh, just walk up, walk away, and that's all you need. So uh, there you go, a little bit of feedback directly from the owner, Michael. Okay, so let's try and summarize my thoughts on the Electra. I think you've probably seen throughout the video. Uh, I do rather like it. It's got some really nice details and design touches about it, which is great. It's sporty to drive, it's practical and functional, uh, it's refined and it's luxurious, so it's a really good package accommodating most needs and wants in a car. Well, what's not so good? Well, I guess the efficiency isn't brilliant, but you know, is a Lamborghini Urus efficient? Is a Bentley Bentayga efficient? No and no, so uh, never mind, let's move on. It's got a big battery to still give it a good usable range and some very fast charging. So, you know, you can still drive this from the south coast or London to Scotland with just one charge stop of a very short period of time. I don't think that's an issue at all, is it? Um, Right, what else? Well, I'd like to see soft close as standard, really, but it's not really a big deal. I guess this camera here on the wing mirror, on the wing, is a, looks like a bit of an afterthought. And I guess when these LiDAR cameras are out, that does affect the visuals a little bit. So that bit particularly looks like a London taxi, doesn't it? And the way this comes out the wing, I mean, it needs to be there, but maybe it could be incorporated into a slightly different scoop in the front wing or something. Uh, but as you can see, I'm nitpicking a little bit here, trying to find things I don't like because it's generally a very, very nice car and I really do like it. So I hope that's been an interesting insight into a uh, customer delivered version of the Lotus Electra. I think it's fantastic. Again, a big thank you to the owner, Michael, for letting us come along and prod and poke it. Maybe if you guys can leave a comment thanking him as well uh, for letting us have a drive and a play with his new car. Uh, if you've got one of these on the way, I think you should be excited. I'm sure you probably are, quite rightly so. Brilliant car, well done. Congratulations to anyone who's getting and buying one of these cars. So, my name is Richard, I hope that's been useful, and I'll see you in another video very soon, hopefully. Make sure you're subscribed, give the video a like, leave your comments, and we'll try and read through them as much as we can. Thank you for watching.